today's message is a combination of two of my loves, uh, worship and teaching. And so we'll teach on worship uh, today. Um, so hopefully we'll have some fun doing that. Uh, the breath series, who, who would say, like, I know we're not like big hand raisers in New Zealand and even less so in, in New Zealand, so just get a hand ready, you know, just this is your moment to pluck our coach. Who would say that you have, uh, you know, encountered God in some way over the last five weeks here as we've gathered? Look at that. That's amazing. Praise the Lord. Well, maybe for the rest of you, today's your day. Maybe for some of those with a hand up, it's like you get a double dose today. The heart of worship. The heart of worship. When I first came to the Lord, I didn't grow up in church. I sort of grew up in a, I would say, a little bit of a happy-ish sort of family. My mum's here, but she's not at this service, so we can talk about it, you know. <laughs> we had a combi van growing up. They painted it themselves, a rag roll sort of a paint. I didn't realise it was cool when I was a teenager. I was just embarrassed by it. <laughs> it broke down every third week. Um, but when we, when, we, when we started to come to church and when I came to faith, we came to faith in a conservative sort of church. And worship was a little bit different than it is here. They didn't believe in musical instruments. So it was just the beauty of our voices. One big problem is my voice might bless the Lord but it doesn't bless anyone else. I reckon heaven must have some sort of auto-tune system. So it goes up bad, but it's received from the Lord through the filter of the heart. And so we had, uh, we had worship and somebody to get a little pitch pipe out. And we would sing song 584. Uh, and I, I, one thing I did like about it is that when you came in, there was a board like sort of, behind the, the, we didn't really have a stage, but behind the altar or behind whatever, and it would have the order of the service. So you knew exactly what was happening. You're like, you'd walk in and be like, yes, song 749, I love that one. <laughs> like just like, you get the hymnals out, you'd work your way through it. And, and then uh, a few years later, Katie and I got married and we started uh, here in this church. And I remember coming in and there's the bands and there wasn't like just like a song and a prayer and a song and some communion and a song and a message or a reading or whatever. We just came in and we just sang like songs back to back to back. And I was like, what the heck is this? And with the, something else was quite new because when you sang like out of hymnals, you just like sung the song, you, you sung the song through, right? You just, you, beginning gets to the end, you might have a little chorus repeat somewhere in there. But when I came to this church, they just kept singing like one song, like over and over, and over. it was like the chorus would go 10 times. I was like, what is this? And I learned that when the worship leader said, let's sing it one more time, they may or may not mean one more time. <laughs> they mean, let's just start with one more time and let's see where it goes. And so then people would have their hands raised and people would show emotion and people would cry and people would cry out. And it was this all new experience. So over the years I've been on this journey of what, what is this thing called worship? And I'm excited to teach on it today. Worship is a huge theme in the scriptures. You can read the story of the Bible lots of different ways. You can read it as a story of worship. I'll, I'll talk more about that. But why does it matter so much? Well, one of the reasons is, is because in Psalm 22 verse 3, it tells us that the Lord dwells within the praises of his people. And as the people of God, and I know we're not all there in that journey, we would maybe identify as that, but as the people of God, I, don't, I want to journey with the presence of God. I want to know the presence of God. I want to have a daily experience of walking with the Lord. I don't just want it to be head beliefs. I don't just want it to be knowledge. I don't just want it to be church subscription. I want a living, real experience of God Monday to Monday, the whole week. And if God dwells within the praises of his people, I want to know that special presence that he manifests so that he appears on it, that he makes himself known and accessible and that is in worship. I want to know how to worship in such a way that he might dwell within it. I think uh, worship has to be like the most practiced thing in church and the least talked about. 
Like, I think we just hope that people get it. Like, if you come along enough times, you get told to raise your hands by the worship leader enough times, and maybe you'll get it. But, but in, in Psalm 47, it says, praise him, praise him with understanding. And, and while it's good to sort of just pick up on the culture and pick up on the vibe, it should come from a conviction. It should come from, I know why I raise my hands. It should come from, I know why we just shout out. We're not just clapping the end of the song. We're praising the Lord. What's that about? We should be able to praise Him with a level of understanding that we actually, all of these experiences are not just going with it, but actually coming from somewhere inside of us that is giving something to God. But there's a lot of challenges when it comes to worship in our modern culture. And uh, like, I've got a whole list here. Like one would be that we are a low church culture. High church would be like the, the, the Catholics, the Anglicans. This is high church. What does it mean? That they have quite structured centuries old liturgies and ways of approaching worship. Whereas that's quite different to our culture, which can sometimes be, oh, just whatever. But that might affect our understanding of worship, just a, just whatever sort of perspective. We live in a culture, as in New Zealand culture, that would be understood as a low power distance ratio culture. What, is, what does that mean? It's like our natural respect for authority figures through the floor. Like if you were to line up all cultures, from highest to lowest, you've probably got some Asian countries right down the highest, natural respect for parents, natural respect for anyone in authority. It's just part of the culture. To not live that way would be like, you know, quite countercultural. That'd be up there. When New Zealand's like down, it's out on the street. Like in, in that measurement. That might affect our worship. We live in an irreverent culture. But cynical, very sort of um, secular, not a lot is sacred except saying the wrong words sometimes, that might affect our worship. We are in a consumeristic culture. We come to consume, whether that's experiences, feelings, products, and we're not immune to that as Christians. We have a version of it that's called consumeristic Christianity that might affect our worship. We live in an entertainment culture, very little ability to concentrate, very little bit ability to stay focused. We're wanting to be entertained. We want another dopamine hit that might affect our worship. We live in a postmodern culture. There isn't a truth, there's just opinions that might affect our worship. We live in a time of rampant Christian music publishing. There are more church songs coming out every day at the moment than came out in a whole year a few decades ago. That might affect our perspective of worship, especially given that most of the most popular Christian music, not written by people who are a part of churches, or, and there's lots of good songs written, don't get me wrong, but just because they're Christian or have God's name in it doesn't mean they're worship songs. It just might mean they're good songs. Yeah. And we live in a time of me, me, and me. That might affect our worship. And could it be possible, given all of these things, that we might get off track when it comes to proper worship? Could it be possible that we might not be worshipping fully God's way, and if he dwells within the praises of his people, could it then be possible that we might be missing out on something of the fullness of his presence in our worship experiences? A lot of modern worship is nothing more than selfish spiritualization of songs with a God vibe. They're more about me, about what I want, about what I need, about what I want to see happen, then they are about exalting the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. We're good at covering it. You know, God's presence not necessarily being among us. You can create the feelings. Tony's a fantastic worship leader. He's great at just covering it up. No, I'm just kidding around. (laughs) 
why we, one of the many reasons why we love Tony and all of our, we don't want to cover it up, we want the real thing. But let's be honest, it's easy to roll with the songs and create the vibes, and you can create the feelings without the presence of God. We don't want that at all. And so, as I said, one of the ways you could see the story of the scriptures is through the story of God's presence and the story of worship. You can read it as a love story, and that would be true. You could read it as a story of redemption, that would be true. You could read it as a story of the people of God and what that means, that would be true. But you can read this book as a story of worship and God's presence, and that would also be a lens you could look at it through. It begins in creation. The Lord creates this world. He says it's good. He creates us. He says it's very good. And it tells us in the story of the Garden of Eden, which is all like temple like God's presence language, it tells us that God dwells with Adam and Eve. It says that in the cool of the evening, that God walks with them. So we have in the creation story, God dwelling on the earth in all of his fullness. But then we get the next story, and it's the story of the fall of Adam and Eve and the fruit and the serpent. And it tells us that actually post that story, that actually God's presence more retreats to heaven then dwells within the earth. He, he touches down on the earth from time to time. He visits. But if the story begins with him dwelling in the earth, it actually quickly moves to him dwelling within the heavens, visiting the earth. But we know that God desires to dwell with his people. So he sets a people apart in the story of the Exodus and it gets them to make a tent. And then for the first time, this tent, this tabernacle, this dwelling place, this movable temple, it tells us that God for the first time, again since the fall, dwells in a permanent way on the earth. It's a significant moment. We're going to come back to it today. And then there's all the story of the people of God. And then we get to the story of Jesus, which is God tabernacling with us, God dwelling with us. The word becomes flesh. The eternal God becomes human and his presence is with us. And then he leaves so that he can pour out his spirit. So his presence will be with us in a different way. And then in Revelation, the story finishes with one day the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, coming back to dwell within the earth once again. And it says that his presence will be available to everyone in the holy city. And it's just this beautiful picture. Are you following? It's a story of God's presence. He's here. He leaves. He touches down a few times. We see him in Jesus. He pours out his spirit and he's coming back to restore his presence and all his fullness here. But the story of his presence is closely interlinked with the story of worship. Every time we see God's presence touching earth, we see either a pre or a post response of worship. We see worship. And so there's something to be learned from the tabernacle story that would help us offer proper worship, help us worship him with understanding, help us not be too casual and experience hopefully the fullness of what he has for us. And so we're going to zoom in on this tabernacle story. We're going to be in Exodus chapter 40. Uh, This is they've just built the tabernacle. It says uh, in verse 34 in Exodus 40, they've just built the tent, they've come out of Egypt, they've crossed the Red Sea, uh, they've got all the instructions from the Lord, they are God's people, they finally built them a cool tent, and it says, then the cloud covered the tabernacle, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could no longer enter the tabernacle because the cloud had settled down over it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. This is that significant moment, right? God was here, God left, and God is back. This is good. This is like, yes, God is back. How awesome. We did what he said. He revealed himself. He asked for the special tent. It's a bit weird, but we did it anyway. And he filled it. He's back. This is what Adam and Eve must have seen. This is what Abraham must have seen. He's back. Oh no, but we can't go near. 
He's back, but we can't get close. He's filled it with such a glory that we dare not enter in. And so if you're ever wondering what Leviticus is all about, everybody's favorite book in the Bible, Leviticus is about how to enter in. Leviticus is about how to draw close. He's back, baby. But how do we get close to him now that he's back? If you're wondering, you need some Leviticus context. And so in Leviticus chapter 1 through 7, it tells us about all of these divine sacrifices that are supposed to be offered as we draw near to his presence. And in Leviticus 8 and 9, it tells us about the royal priesthood, the, the priests, the people who are supposed to offer the sacrifices on behalf of the people so they might be able to draw near to his presence. And when they do all of this, they are able to enter in. And so we'll skip to Leviticus chapter 9 in verse 22. It says, after that, after what? They've offered all the sacrifices. Aaron raised his hands towards the people. He blessed them. Then after presenting the sin offering, the burn offering, the peace offering, he stepped down from the altar. Then Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle. And when they came out, they blessed the people again. And the glory of the Lord appeared to the whole community. God's back. We dare not draw close. God gives instructions. If you would offer these sacrifices by these people, you can draw into my presence. And when you come into my presence, you will receive a blessing that you're able to take from my presence and bless the entire community. This is why the worship of God's people matters. God's presence is available to us in a special way when we gather. Jesus said, when two or three gather in my name, he's talking about when you come together to worship him. He's not talking about when you have a coffee. He's talking about when you come together to give him glory, there I will be with you. Yeah. He's talking about when his church gathers. And there is a blessing that God wants to give in that special way that he dwells within the praises of his people, plural, not just my praises, that is not just for us, but is supposed to come from us during the week. Does this make sense? This is why it matters. And I know that we've got the Spirit available to us. I know that Jesus fulfills the pattern. I'm going to show you all of that. But I think there's something to be learned from the pattern in Leviticus that would enlighten our worship today. Okay? So chapters 1 through 7, the divine sacrifices, this is what's all about. The first thing is, is we have the sin offering. The sin offering, the purification offering. For this, this is my bowl of blood today. This is all Vikings-like. You wouldn't have watched that because you're a Christian. Uh, but, you know, they got, the, they got an animal, they killed it. It wasn't about the animal, it was about the blood. And they'd get the blood and they'd sprinkle it and they'd smear it and they'd do different stuff. They wouldn't drink it. They'd, they'd flick it over different things. And they would do that as a sign of being purified from their sins. This was about purification of sin. This was the sin offering. This is where you began because before you can sit with the Lord around his table, you've got to deal with your sin. God wants you to sit there, but you've got to deal with your sin. So this was the sin offering. And we shouldn't be surprised because in the story of the scriptures, blood is a really big theme. Genesis chapter 3, Adam and Eve fall. They try to make a covering for themselves, for their fallenness. For their vulnerabilities, they make them out of leaves because that's all they have access to. And God looks at them and goes, that's not good. Let me make you something better. Tells us that he makes animal skins for them. And so as far as we can tell, this is the first death in the scripture in that sense. And an animal is killed to create a proper covering. Hence, this theme begins right in Genesis 3 of blood having something to do with covering. In Exodus which is the story right before Leviticus. The people of God were leaving slavery in Egypt and God told them that the spirit of death is going to come over all of the land and kill every firstborn person. But if they get a, uh, if they get a uh, animal, a lamb without blemish that's been in their home, that they love, that they cherish, that has a name to them, you know, something that matters to them, and they kill it and they take some of the blood and they put it over the doorpost, it will act as like a covering and the spirit of death will pass over and they will be rescued from that plague. And so 
they killed an animal because they trusted that somehow in it, I don't think they ever believed it was actually doing it, it was an act of faith, but somehow in that, this was all about being cleansed. This is all about being purified. This is all about being cleansed. Then the next offering they were supposed to bring is what we know as the whole burnt offering. We've got some wood to resemble a whole burnt offering. They get a, an animal and they just burn that thing up. It's a whole burnt offering. And it would come with an accompanying grain offering. A burnt offering is about, not about something being destroyed. It was about it being transformed into an aroma that could be received by the Lord. There's some mystery in this, and that's okay, but it would be transformed. It wasn't about being destroyed by the fire, transformed by the fire, that it might be received from the Lord. And uh, it would resemble like giving your whole self to God. Nothing held back. It's like, what does the Lord require of us? To love the Lord our God with all, not some of, all our heart, soul, body, and mind. This is the whole burnt offering with its accompanying little grain offering or wine offering sometimes. And you're like, well, I already offered the whole thing. Why do you need this? Oh, because you don't just come with all that you are. You bring all that you have. Like, you know, if you got invited to the king's coronation, as far as I know, no one from Curate got invited. Bummer. Um... While your presence is probably appreciated, you don't come empty-handed. You bring a gift, right? Because that's what you do when you come to see a king, when you come to see someone. You, you don't come empty-handed. I mean, just when you go to someone's house for dinner, you don't come empty-handed, right? I know they say don't bring anything. You still bring something, right? Because you know that that's like, that's the tea hanger of it. That's, that's how it works. That's how this thing works. And so... This is the whole burnt offering. The whole burnt offering has lots of stories in Scripture. It's like Genesis 8, 21 is the first whole burnt offering. It's after the flood. Noah and his family offer a whole burnt offering to the Lord. It's, uh, it's Ephesians 5, verse 2. It says, follow the example of Christ who gave up his life. And it says, like, a pleasing aroma to the Lord. This is whole burnt offering language. In Judges chapter 13, it tells us that they were offering a whole burnt offering to the Lord. And they said that in it, they saw the Spirit of the Lord or an angel actually travel with it to the Lord's presence. It's beautiful. If this is about cleansing, though, this is about this Bible word called consecration. I think Tony talked a bit about that last week. Consecration. It's about being set apart. It's about... Who, who, who you are, what you're about. It's about being set apart for the Lord. Are we following? And then the last offering is the peace offering. In this offering, they would bring an offering to the Lord and the priest would keep a small portion of it, but actually the worshiper would retain what was given after they like dedicated it to the Lord. They were able to take it home and enjoy a meal with their friends and family in glory to the Lord. Does this make sense? So in this offering, the ancient Israelites more understood it as God giving you something. Like God, it's like a, it's an offering of fellowship. It's an offering of peace. It's an offering of community, of relationship. It's Psalm 23, the Lord sets a table before me in the presence of my enemies. He anoints my head with oil. My cup overflows. This is the peace offering. This is his presence. This is what it's all about. The, the blood, the smoke, and the meal. This was the pattern of their worship. All of their sacrifices fell into these categories. And the Lord wanted them to be able to enter the tabernacle and sit with them and enjoy community with them. But there was a tikanga, there was a process, there was something, there was a way for them to come. There was no lack of desire for the Lord, but you come the right way. Does this make sense? You come the right way. It's like a, we got a daughter. I hope that she marries a great man one day. But to get a seat at her table, you come through me. Well, like we understand this process of the things that matter in this world. There's a process. You, you want to you wanna walk onto the Mirai? You're invited. You're invited. I don't think you can come however you want because this matters to us and we have a process. 
And you've got to go through the process. And the process isn't saying we don't want you or we're not making you jump through hoops. We're wanting you to discover something on the way that would enrich this experience down this end of the table. Does that make sense? It's not just, it's not, just not important. It's not just like, oh, traditions. It's like, no, this, this, it does something that enriches this. And so Jesus fulfills this pattern. Right? Jesus fulfills this pattern. Jesus offers his own blood and every animal that was ever offered and all that blood was shed was only ever shed in faith that one day the right blood would be shed that actually had the power to cover us, cleanse us, purify us. Those animals could never do it. They were acts of faith until God would reveal the blood that could do it. And that blood is the blood of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. You're newish at church, you're wondering why we sing about blood, talk about blood. It's not because we're weird Vikings. It's because there's power in the blood. It's because without the blood, there ain't no sin at the table. It's without the shedding of blood that washes us as white as snow, which makes no sense because it is red. Without that crimson stain, which washes us clean, there ain't no sitting at the table. And so we come in faith of the blood that Jesus shed on the cross is how we begin to make our way to the Lord's table. What does this mean for worship? Well, let me show you in Hebrews chapter 13. I'm sorry for the people in this room. I'm really on this side heaps, but I love you equally. Okay? Most of you. Um, (laughs) Hebrews 13 verse 10. We have an altar from which the priests in the tabernacle have no right to eat. Under the old system, the high priest brought the blood of animals into the holy place as a sacrifice for sin, and the bodies of the animals were burned outside the camp. So also Jesus suffered and died outside the city gates to make his people holy by means of his own blood. So let us go out to him outside the camp, bear the disgrace he bore, for this world is not our permanent home. We are looking forward to a home yet to come. Therefore, let us offer through Jesus a continual sacrifice of praise to God, proclaiming our allegiance to him. When you come here, you don't need to offer blood because Jesus has already offered his blood. But Hebrews tells us, but that doesn't mean you don't have a sacrifice to bring. And in response to the blood, you bring a sacrifice of praise. A sacrifice of praise. I'm going to say this as politely as I can. Why is it called a sacrifice? Because God's not that concerned when it comes to these things, about how you feel, about your personality, about your temperament, about your insecurity, about the way you like to do it, because we're not worshiping you. It's a sacrifice, because he asks us to lay down our dignity, and lay down our personality, and lay down our preferences, and lay down our comfort levels, and lay down being concerned about what people might think and to sacrifice something to them, a sacrifice of praise. In Greek, there's three words when we read worship or praise. There's three different Greek words that could be used in the Psalms. There's seven different Hebrew words that can be used. And let me just make this real, real clear what none of them mean. None of them mean you do you, boo-boo. Not a single time that you read the word praise or worship in the Bible Could it be interpreted, you just do what you're comfortable with? There are seven words, and this might enlighten some of our worship experiences. Some of them mean to raise your hands to the Lord. So when it says praise the Lord, it doesn't mean like, just sing quietly like this to him. It actually means raise your hands to the Lord in worship. Some of them mean make beautiful melody to the Lord. I'm like, I try, Lord, but I can't. Some of them mean fall to your knees in reverence to the Lord. 
Some of them mean just keep singing the same thing over and over again and don't focus so much on the word, but focus on the Lord. Like just like in a meditative state, just keep singing hallelujah, 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 and get lost in that and, get, and, and find the Lord at a deeper level than just trying to engage at that mental level. Some of them mean dance around before the Lord and be joyful. And who cares what anyone thinks because I'm not here for them. Be indignant. Just, just throw it away. Just, just, just lose it in the Lord's presence. This is David. I'll be even more crazy than this. It's that lady who turned up years ago dressed in a bridal gown. Oof. Please don't do that. It's weird. <laughs> Some of them mean to shout to the Lord and clap your hands and hoot and holler. Some of them mean to just be silent and reverent to the Lord, but none of them mean just do what you're comfortable with. Because the way to come into the Lord's presence is to offer a sacrifice of praise that my sins are forgiven, that I've been washed clean, that if it wasn't for the sacrifice of Jesus, I'd have nothing and be nothing. And so what else could I do but fall to my knees some Sundays, right? And just, thank you, Jesus. Without you, I don't know where I would be. I don't want to take it for granted, Lord, what you've done for me. Jesus fulfills it, but he asks for something in return. We get to the whole burnt offering. We're on our way to communion and fellowship with the Lord, but what's the whole burnt offering? The whole burnt offering is our life of surrender to the Lord. We don't burn an animal, we burn our lives. It's, I've got a few scriptures here. It's Psalm 51. Psalm 51, and it, it says... Um, you do not, in verse 16, you do not desire a sacrifice or I would offer one. You do not want a burnt offering. The sacrifice you desire is a broken spirit. You will not reject a broken and repentant heart, O oh God. He wants your heart. He wants your vulnerability. He wants you to know that you need him. It's Isaiah chapter 1. In verse, man, we could start anywhere. It's pretty hardcore. Verse 11, what makes you think I want all your sacrifices, says the Lord. I'm sick of your burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fat and calves. I get no pleasure from the blood of bulls and lambs and goats. When you come to worship me, who asks you to parade through my courts with all your ceremonies, your pre-rolls, your lights, your songs, all of your other things. Uh, stop bringing you, me your meaningless gifts, blah, 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 blah. Verse 16, wash yourselves and be clean. Get your sins out of my sight. Give up your evil ways. Learn to do good, to seek justice, to help the oppressed, to defend the cause of orphans. Fight for the rights of widows. Come, let's settle this, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, I will make them white as snow. Though they are like red, like crimson, I will make them as white as wool. If only you will obey me, you will have plenty to eat. It's Romans 12 Verse 1. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he's done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Can you, can you hear it? You don't have to throw an animal on there. You throw your life. You throw your repentant, desperate heart. You throw your obedience. You throw everything and you offer yourself. This is proper worship. Thank you for the blood. If you want me to sing, dance, shout, kneel, whatever, thank you. And what would be a natural response? I give myself to you again. I re-surrender. Have it all, God. Nothing's off limits. Have my heart, have my soul, have my mind, have my strength. Teach me to love you like you love me. 
Let me give my whole self to you. Nothing held back. There's a few things in my life I'm quite nervous to say that about God today. But I just, I know you're good. And if anyone could be trusted with them, it's you. I want to give my whole self to you, God. I'm terrified of what that might mean, but I know you're good because you, you died for me. So I give myself to you. And that's good because that's sort of like spiritual. We've got problems with this one though. Look, you know, we don't do monetary offerings in our services because people give during the week generally. The people who do give, you know, the third of you. <laughs> the third of you that have some revelation. You want to sit at the Lord's table, you don't get it. If he doesn't have all you have, he doesn't have all of you. If you got problems giving money to the Lord, you got problems giving your heart to the Lord. The reason we used to have offerings and services is because we understood that bringing an offering to the Lord of something that mattered to us was part of worship, not just a spiritual practice, not just a good thing to do, but it was, it was worship. We'd sing, right? And you pass the little things around and you put your check in because it's worship. Praise you, Lord. I give my whole self to you and just, what, what else do you need? I've got a bunch of stuff. Do you want any of it? like directly for your purposes? Because like, I'm open. Yeah, I trust, I, I give them, I've surrendered. So why would I be tight? Why would I be tight with anything that I have? I don't just offer myself, I offer my time, my talent, my treasure to the Lord. It's making sense, right? Yeah. Getting quiet because it's convicting good. Yeah. This is Ephesians 5, 2, right? Follow the example of Christ who offered himself a pleasing aroma to the Lord. This is surrender. This is what this is all about in worship. And then, <laughs> now we get to the best bit. This is, this is what it's all about. This is the best bit. That for every single one of us, the Lord has prepared a table before us in the presence of our enemies, in the presence of your struggles in the presence of whatever crap is going on in your life. I see crap in church. In the presence of your unanswered prayers, in the presence of the things that are coming against you, in the presence of all that is life, despite all of that, he has prepared a table and he invites you to come and sit. Not like to sit like the way you sit at McDonald's, like where you're just sort of like, let's eat and let's get out of here. But the way you sit at a friend's table that has those comfy dining chairs. That way where it's like the meal's finished, but we lost track of time. Oh, we finished eating a long time ago, but there's another bottle of wine. And we are laughing and we're telling stories, and there is joy, and there's healing, and there's just, this was called the peace offering. There is, there is peace in my soul sitting at this end of the table. And I know we want it. Who doesn't want that, right? It's like, I want that. I love that. We all want that. But proper worship understands how to come to the table. How to come to the table. Jesus sets this end of the table. If he, if he offered his blood, and if our response, because he gave his all for us, is to offer our full selves to him, we must remember that this table is set with his body and his blood. The meal that we enjoy here, the life-sustaining, joy-giving meal that we enjoy here, <laughs> is his body broken for us and his blood poured out for us. And in worship, 
You got juice, I got this. We just get to enjoy the Lord's presence. Sometimes when we come to try and enjoy the Lord's presence without going through the process, it's a bit hit and miss. It's a bit like we came wanting to get something and God wants to give something, don't misunderstand me, like God wants to give something around the table. But when we come primarily wanting to get something, not to give something, we've lost the heart of worship. The heart of worship is trusting that there's a table set before me. I'll dance as long as I need to. I'll shout as long as I need to. I'll re and I'll trust that somehow in that process, I'll find myself there. It's sort of like we don't give to get, but there is a blessing that the Lord pours out on those who are faithful to Him. But if that becomes your motivation for giving, you're no longer giving, you're getting, which is to completely have missed it. So a, a few little caveats as we finish. The, the first is in church, there needs to be freedom for people to be wherever they are on their worship journey, right? There needs to be freedom. It's like a, the worship leaders, I'm like, never tell everybody to raise your hands. Like it can be an invitation if that's something you feel like is important as you lead people in that time, but never tell everybody because everyone's not in that same place in their journey. So there needs to be freedom but there still needs to be conviction about what proper worship is and isn't. And we need to be able to hold those tensions amongst our gathered experiences. We need to understand that there are a lot of good songs written out there, but many should never be sung on Sunday morning because they're just not worship songs to the Lord. We need to understand, I've already talked about this with the worship team, the order the songs are in matters. It matters because it's about the liturgy. It's about the process. But here's really the heart of it. In Leviticus chapter 9 quickly flicks to Leviticus chapter 10. They got the pattern and then some people offered some strange smoke to God. We always joked in youth group about what that was. Smoke some weed to the Lord or something. The Lord struck them dead. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, they're trying to bring the presence of the Lord, they're trying to bring the Ark of the Covenant, the representation of the presence of the Lord, into the city of Jerusalem so that the capital might be blessed, that the whole nation might be blessed. David's doing this. They take it, they build this like really nice cart for it, this really nice thing. They get some oxen to tow it, they have it on there. They're going along, got a whole hoopla going on, think they've built this really special thing. Oh my goodness, the Lord's going to come, this is going to be amazing. Uzzah. It like stumbles, it's going to tip. Who's it like, I don't know, he reached out, the Lord struck him dead. David's like, what the heck, man? Like, that's God, I'm just trying to bring the presence of the Lord into the city. I'm just trying to get people to sit at the table, experience the blessing. They go, they park at an Obed-Edom's house, the, the, the ark, and uh, in, in there, uh, it's sitting there. And everything in Obed-Edom's house, because it's in his garage, like it's blessed. And so David's like, gosh, we need to figure out how to move this thing. And they go back and consult the law and they realize it was never supposed to be carried on flash carts, on these man-made systems and things. They realized it was supposed to be carried on the backs of Levites. They went back and read the book of Leviticus and they're like, man, we want the Lord, we want this. But they realized they were going about it the wrong way. And so when they figured out how to go about it the right way, they did an even bigger hoopla, brought it into the city, everything's happening. And then the nation entered its most season of ever being blessed, the nation of Israel once that thing came into the city. This is what's at stake in our worship, guys. It's not just that we would experience the Lord as great as that is. There's something that's supposed to go with us, go beyond us, go from this place that is supposed to bless our city. They're supposed to bless our neighborhoods, supposed to bless our businesses. And so we wanna offer proper worship. The worship team can come because we know do some worship and we'll finish around the Lord's table. Matt Redman penned these words and everyone can stand if you're willing and able. In 1999, the song, The Heart of Worship. When the music fades and all is stripped away, 
and I simply come longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within through the way things appear you're looking into my heart. I'm coming back to the heart of worship and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it when it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. Oh God, our God, we thank you for your blood. We thank you for your table. And we come to worship and to praise you in such a way that we might walk through the invitation to your presence and experiencing you in new and greater ways. In Jesus' name, amen.